Excuse me one second. Technical difficulty. Mm-hmm. One second. Even downright buddy, buddy, buddy. We shall miss the past, buddy, buddy, but there's still buddy cats. No, don't be naughty, go meet everybody here on buddy cats. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the founder and host of BuddyCast, Nick Sorensen. Welcome back, buddies, to everybody's favorite show, BuddyCast. I'm your host, Nick Sorensen, and joining me today is a special buddy. We've been waiting for this episode. It's gold, I tell you, gold, <laughs> right here on BuddyCast, my buddy, Steve Heitner. How are you doing today, Steve? I'm doing great. I love the intro. Thank you. Who did the voiceover of your introduction? I feel like I know that voice. Um, the Nick Sorensen one. Yeah, ladies That's and gentlemen. That's my buddy Trent Wrench. Yeah, he's a really great. good, really good magician um, from North Carolina. Very great man. He's actually in the wedding party too. So awesome, awesome. Yep. So Steve, I got to start out this show by asking, what inspired you to go into acting? Um. Well. I'll tell you, a lot of people have very artistic stories. Uh, I am a sports fanatic. I actually had a sports podcast for several years um, uh, that was called That's Gold uh, with Steve Heitner. Guess why not go right at it? Um, And uh, anyway, so I'm a huge sports fan. My best friend growing up was a year older than I was. He did a play. Everybody thought he was hilarious. And my sports kind of competitive aspect was like, I'm funnier than he is. And so that's that was my first impetus to try acting was to be, you know, funnier than he was. Uh, and then I kind of fell in love with it. But the first the first thing was very much of a competitive sports minded kind of thing. Um, but like I said, then I fell in love with it. Nice. Nice. So how did you how did you discover the role of Kenny Banya? Well, I had been um I've been working for several years by the time I did uh, Banya on Seinfeld. Um, and so at that point, I was getting a lot of guest starring roles. I had done a couple of um, <clears throat> supporting roles in movies and whatnot, but I was really booking a lot of guest star roles. So the Seinfeld show was interested in me. And Kenny Banya was actually the fourth role I auditioned for. And like, you know, there are Seinfeld fanatics out there. So they're always like, what three parts? What three parts didn't you get? And I don't remember them all. I know one of them was um, Kramer had the scent of the of a, the beach. And there was a guy who owned the fragrance company. And I think I had auditioned for that guy. But uh, Jerry and Larry liked me. And they were trying to find the right part for me. And then when Banya came along, obviously it turned out to be the right deal. Mm-hmm. I like that. I like that they didn't just give you some minor role that was just like, and eh, we'll just toss him in here and maybe he'll grow into something or we'll use him again. They really found that key role for you. Well, it's interesting. The, that role is a, the story behind booking it. Um, all it said on the, audi- on the sides, the sides are the small amount of, of lines that you read for the audition. Um, maybe your, your audience knows that. Um, all it said was the most annoying person in the world. So of course, immediately I'm like, well, it's thoughtful they think of me when they think of the most annoying person in the world. But when you audition for shows, you're in a waiting room and then they call you in one by one. Now the walls are pretty thin. You can't help but hear other people auditioning. You're not trying to, you just can't help it. And so everybody was doing this thing with Banya where uh, kind of more angry, more like, hey, you owe me. I gave you that suit. You, I, I, you know, I gave you, uh, you owe me a meal. I gave you, right? So I'm listening to that and I'm like, eh, I don't think that kind of anger can really last. It might be funny for two seconds, but that can't really last. So I just came up with this idea of what if he's annoying because he adores Jerry? Like he just, and now you would say, well, that was the character. Well, that wasn't necessarily the character. Everybody else was doing it like they were irritated. I did it like a puppy dog. 
So when I went in for my audition and they had been seeing guys be angry the whole time, and I went in and I was like, hey, Jerry, and just adored him. Larry and Jerry just fell off their off the couch and we all just stopped and laughed for a couple of minutes over that. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, I got this one. Nice. So I, I like how you went to film, you know, like everyone else was annoying, like the angry annoying. But you yeah. really were like, you thought, hey, I could make this character, like you said, like a puppy dog. Like, hey, I'm going to follow him around. Like that one friend that always sends you that, you know, that won't, won't stop sending you messages. That won't stop, you know, exactly. every time you see him in every time you see him in public, kind of like Jerry did in the episode. Like you see him in public, you go, oh, no, not him. You yeah. Know? And it's more fun when it's upbeat like that. Yeah. You know, and then you then, you know, when you do it, when I did that and I got cast, then the first time we do the uh, the read through and then the writers see what I did with it and then they get inspired by that. And then the writing and the acting, you know, then it just turns into something special. And that's kind of what happened in that situation. And that's why they just started having Banya back again and again. Uh, and Jerry just loved the character Like he would. He would jam me into episodes in the middle of the week when they were re rehearsing. Like, I think the perfect example of that is uh, the Soup Nazi episode where where Banya tries to cut in line. It's like that was a classic thing of like they're rehearsing all, during the week and Jerry goes, hey, call Steve. Let's, let's have Banya cut in line. So it was great because Jerry would just he would just stick Banya in. Mm -hmm. That brings up a good question. What? What was your favorite episode? I know that's probably asking, like, what's your favorite child or so, but what episode did you say you enjoyed the most? Of mine or the or this, or the the uh, series? Let's do both. All right. So um, I really liked several. I mean, I mean, in all honesty, I liked them all. But I would say the first one where, uh, you know, I give him this uh, – of the suit and he has to get me meals obviously that one was amazing because i had come up with this character that was so look by the time i did that show it was their sixth season so they're already the number one show in the world now i come in with this character that is so large so broad right so i'm thinking you know if i do this character and it doesn't work i'm screwed you know, I, then I fall on my face on the number one show in the world. So it's an amazing opportunity, but it was, it was a little scary. So when we would do like the first uh, uh, scene um, when they're in the diner and I come in and I come up to the table at the diner and I'm out of my mind, you know, the character is huge. And none of them, all four of them sitting there, Larry, uh, <coughs> not Larry, uh, Jerry, uh, Julia, Michael and Jason. So the four of them are sitting in the um, in the booth, and when we're rehearsing, they can't they can't keep a straight face. Every time I go into that Banya energy, they just start cracking up, and we're having a blast all week. And then the day before tape night, I start taking it down a little, and they're in the booth, and Jerry goes, "What are you doing?" I'm like, what? What? I'm not doing anything. He goes, no, 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 yeah, no, you're taking it down. He goes, don't, don't change it, don't change it. And I go, all right, can we talk? And they're like, yeah, of course we can talk. We go, this character is enormous. If I do this character this large and it doesn't work, I mean, I'm screwed. You know, I'm I'm doing bad work on the number one show in the world. And the four of them are like, just trust it, trust it, just trust it. And uh, I, when we did tape night, you know, tape night, there's hundreds of a couple hundred people in that audience. Uh, and I came in with that energy and the audience laughed so hard. I always say it was like, it was a character they already knew, right? It was, they were just like in, they were just in on that guy. And uh, Jerry looks upstage at me. So the audience is, is over here and he looks over at me and he looks at me and he goes, I told you, he just mouths. I told you. And we were off to the races. So that was a great episode. And then there was something also about the mentor episode, which is the one that has the, uh, that's gold, Jerry, gold in it. Mm -hmm. So the uh, the character had this cadence, like in the first episode, and for several episodes, where it would be the best, Jerry, the best. And that would be that repetitive thing. Then it felt like that kind of got used, so we stopped doing it. And then by the time we got to the mentor episode, which was kind of near the end, of the years 
uh, that line was just, that's gold. And, that, and then I said, this is when we should bring back the cadence. That's gold, Jerry, go. And then that really, really, obviously really worked because I can't go outside of my house without somebody screaming at me. I was about to say, did, did you ever think that would be your catchphrase in the future? Like, did you ever feel like that would be like something that would follow you around the rest of your life? No, I, never. Of course, never for a minute. Um, and Banya had a couple of catchphrases, you know, uh, mm -hmm. soup's not a meal. Uh, th that's gold, Jerry gold. Um, uh, the, but the thing is, some people ask me, does it bother you? <clears throat> and I'm like, look. There's a couple of ways to look at it. I look at it this way. When I go out, somebody's going to yell, that's gold, Jerry, gold. If I decide to make that a negative, that's probably a dumb decision on my part, right? Because it's going to happen anyway. It's going to happen anyway. So I just take it as how it's meant. It's meant as a compliment. Now, mm -hmm. some people are cooler than other people. You know, if somebody's yelling at it, me, yelling it at me while I'm having dinner with my family, you know, eh, probably not, <laughs> probably not the best time. Yeah. But, for the, but for the most part, no, you have to look at it as uh, you have to look at it as a compliment. Mm -hmm. You kind of have to look at it as like you can't stop the rain. You're, you're not going to stop the rain by complaining. You know, that's exactly what I mean. So, you know, that's my little Zen answer of embrace it because here it comes. Mm -hmm. But that brings up a nice follow up question for me. What, when it comes to Bania, what was your favorite line if you had to choose one? Um. It's a good question, and I don't want to avoid it, but when I see the scenes, sometimes I think some of the best work of Jerry and I together are facial expressions and pauses more than necessarily the lines. Like when Jerry, when I, when I say, uh, um, you work out, you should, and Jerry goes, why? And then Banya's face just falls, like, just stumped on having no reason why somebody should work out. And I love that moment because it's just actors taking the time. And, uh, like, when I tell him, uh, nah, I, I had a hot dog. Uh, I'll have the meal another time. And he does this little head thing of, and it's, it's not a line. But as soon as he does that, the, the audience went nuts. So, I mean, I have a, I, I had a lot of really crazy uh, lines, but I would say, you know, if I'm going to say what my favorite line is, I, my favorite line was that's gold, Jerry gold, because when I saw the episode, you know, you do a lot of takes. And I had a very set idea of how I wanted that line to come off with where I, when I looked up from the paper, when I said the line. I had a very specific idea of that. But when you do a lot of takes, the editor takes over. They can turn it into what they want to turn it into. So I do remember when I saw the episode and I, they used exactly the take I wanted them to use. So sometimes that's what it's about. So I will, I'll, I'll stick with that's gold, Jerry Gold, because I had a s strong idea of what I wanted and it didn't get messed up and the editor saw it as well and that's how it came out. Awesome. How would you say you relate to Banya? Like, how do you how do you relate to him? Um, you know, there's there's sides of it where it's kind of a, an amalgam, <clears throat> an amalgam meaning you know, taking a bunch of people and putting them together. So it's kind of an amalgam of those guys that hang out at the comedy club that aren't necessarily comedians, or maybe they're just not very developed comedians but they want to be in that clique. They want to be in that circle, you know, and the headline clubs don't have that as much, but like when you were in the days in New York at the comic strip, catch a rising star, LA, the uh, comedy store, it's more clicky where there are a bunch of comedians around at the same time. And these guys that just want that energy and they want to, they want to suck off of that energy. So it's an amalgam of a bunch of those guys. But then if you're being honest, and to me, to make the character even more interesting is to find out when you're that guy, when I'm that guy, right? And try and draw on that. When am I needy? When am I puppy dogish? And try and bring some of that there. So even like, suppose you're playing a murderer, you know, you have to find, you have to justify it. You can't go, oh, I'm playing a bad guy. He's a bad guy. You have to, in your mind, come up with some idea of why he's doing this, that he 
justifies it to himself. So that was, that's what I would do with Banya as well as I try and justify him. When am I like a puppy dog? And why does that make perfect sense at that moment to be a puppy dog? Hmm. So that's kind of a, maybe too much of an answer for your question. No, 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 not at all. Yeah. But uh, that's the way I look at it. I, I feel like, uh, yeah, what, what am I, what am I Banya like? Because when you create a character, that's great. But if you're going to do it over five years, we well, have to live in it a little more and you have to have the character develop a little more. I mean, look, look how Kramer developed over the years. You know, you can't just sit there and be doing the same thing you did on day one. So you kind of have to inhabit the character more and more. And in the audience, even if they don't realize it, they're expecting you to do that. They're expecting you to flesh it out a little more. Certainly. You're absolutely right. Characters develop over time. Yeah. Audience is expected, like you said, you know, like you said, it really um, builds up like it, like you, how do you think you compared from when you first started to maybe like the final scene that you ever did on Seinfeld? How would you yeah. say like you've really developed out of that? Um, I think that I tried to have Banya listen a little more or a little better because, you know, the first inspiration of Banya, he was just like, ah, I need this, I need this, I, I, I want this, I need this, you know, that, that kind of jackal. And so I was just trying to like, by the time I get to the mentor thing and find out what's Banya like when he's intently listening, which is not what Banya was doing in the beginning episodes, right? When he just wanted uh, wanted his meal. So I think that was one of the um, arcs that were interesting, especially in the mentor episode, because I, I adore Jerry in a different way where now I'm listening to him. Love it. Now, you know, I got to ask. You can ask in, your, in your opinion, is Super Meal? <laughs> well, you have to ask. Apparently, like every waiter, whoever waits on me has to <laughs> ask. I literally cannot ask what the soups are without the waiter going, ah. <laughs> like, no, seriously, what are your soups? Uh, but for me, I enjoyed the scene on the steps with on the stoop with Julia where she was saying, well, were there crackers? You know, did he crack, you know? So to me, <clears throat> I think that could um, take over <clears throat> whether, it's a, uh, whether it's a meal or not. Let me ask you this. I enjoy a bowl of chili. Often it's in the uh, soup sec section of the menu. I would consider that a meal. There you go. But we certainly, uh, the universe must have Banya believe soup is not a meal <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> i see that function i see that now buddy don't go anywhere we got to play a quick ad from our sponsors great this buddy cast is brought to you by harper ridge golf course if you're in the area area looking to play a quick nine sharpen your skills on the putting green or driving range or looking to play fling, fling golf while having some quality time with buddies head over to harbor ridge at 3730 harbor ridge trail when you're finished Head over to the Harborview Grill to enjoy a good meal, some live music, a gorgeous view of Lake Erie, and some more good times. Call them today at 814-898-4653. Tell my buddy Adam that Buddy sent you. And that was our sponsor's Harbor Ridge Golf Course. You a golfer at all? Yeah, you know what? I just got back from doing a charity uh, golf event in San Diego. Uh, for the past uh, two days, we golfed on uh, on Monday. I don't know if you're aware that a lot, most charity events at gol uh, golfing are on Mondays because the course is closed on Mondays. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, golfed a charity event on Monday, and I uh, got back home uh, yesterday. Uh, I've got, you know, look, we've all had a brutal uh, winter, and uh, Erie, I'm sure, they had a brutal winter. Uh, I'm up in Tahoe, Reno, Tahoe area now. And we had, uh, oh, 600 feet of snow. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, brutal, brutal. So I think everybody's just, so we were down in San Diego the past couple of days, 68 and sunny and golfing. And you're like, oh, I forgot life could be like this. So uh, we're, we're diving into it. And uh, I'm not a great golfer, but I can get around the course. Also, at the charity event, they're not looking for me to shoot a 68. They're looking for me to be funny with the sponsors. You know, I know my... I know my job. So I hit the ball well enough. Uh, if, uh, you know, if, if it's, if it's too much, I know when to pick my ball up. 
But uh, I do enjoy golf. It is, you know, it's so frustrating. I'd say if the point, if the object of the game was to get the ball in the hole with as many strokes as possible and maybe get a club in the water or something like that, I'd be on the PGA right now. You'd be the man. You know? <laughs> You'd be the man. Yeah, yeah, that's another thing that I uh, – my ball can find any water on, on the course. Mm -hmm. and I had another hole like that uh, on Monday. Heavy water up the right side. I get up the left side. I avoid it. And on my next swing, I hit my one shank to the right. And it looked like I was past the water. And I still found the water. Mm -hmm. It's just, um, yeah. yeah. But the, the other thing about golf is what I got, what I did get good at in golf is I came to a point, because I used to get mad, right? And then I came to a point in golf and I said, hey, Steven, you don't golf enough to get mad. Because you're, you're just going to be furious the whole time. And I just had to talk with myself. And it worked. And so now I golf. I just go and I enjoy the day. Even on the crazy shank into the water on the side. I'm just like, you don't golf. You don't have the right to get mad. Right? You don't play enough. So you see people that like have single digit handicaps. You know what they do? They golf. <laughs> they golf a lot. And that's how they get there. So I've, I've become nice. I've kinder to myself and just go and try and realize we're there for a charity. <laughs> try and have a couple of have a couple of free cocktails and enjoy uh, the day. I could just see you doing like a bad shot and just reminding yourself as you're walking back, it's for charity, it's for charity, it's for charity. As like you're as like the <laughs> club's going like this, it's for charity, it's for charity. It's you I don't think it doesn't happen. You're walking, it's for the kids, it's for the kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's for the kids, Jerry, it's for the kids. <laughs> yeah, it definitely happens. But so yeah, I golf a little bit. One of the annoying things is that uh, my wife, uh, she is a very good golfer. So I took her with her to this, and she does something that's infuriating. Infuriating, she two putts, which is really annoying. Um, and uh, I am a man that will never beat his wife at golf. So I've had to accept that as well. Uh, everyone in my family is a golfer but me. I say the gene skips a generation or something, you know? Right. Well, everyone, you know what? It's, infuri it's infuriating. It's aggravating. You're doing yourself a great favor. Yeah. Look at this. Look at this as one of your your best qualities that you don't yeah. golf. Bingo. There we go. <laughs> there we go. So I want to get going back to the interview a little bit. You also are in stand up comedy. Like you said, 90% of your career nowadays is stand up comedy. What what sparked that interest? Well, you know, we were talking about acting. So mm -hmm. when I moved into Manhattan, I was probably 18 years old. And I was trying to get a you know acting career going. I was studying at acting with some of the great teachers, some of the great teachers of all time that at the time were great teachers, but we didn't know they were going to be legends. Like I was studying with uh, uh, um, uh, Fred Caraman. Uh, I was studying with uh, um, now the names are out of my head right now. Uh, Uta Hagen. Uta Hagen is like a legend of acting. I studied with her when I was eighteen, uh, and then I was trying to get acting work and waiting tables while I was trying to get acting work. So as I was struggling to get acting work in those years in the mid eighties, stand up was blowing up. It was blowing up in the cities and in Manhattan, it was the comic strip, Catch a Rising Star and the improv. And you had to try and pass at one of those clubs to become one of their comics. And um, so it was stage time. And I had some interest in stand up, but not a huge amount. But it was a way to perform. So I said, OK. So I started doing auditions. Uh, and not too long after, I passed at the comic strip in New York, which is the club that uh, Jerry Seinfeld came out of, uh, Paul Reiser, Eddie Murphy, uh, Chris Rock. They all came out of the comic strip. Um, and I passed at that club. And so then all of a sudden, I was doing stand up. And then I was starting to do gigs where I was going because, like I said, stand up was blowing up at that time. So every bar in Connecticut or Jersey had a comedy night. So you would go do those and start making money. And uh, I enjoyed it. But in my heart, I still wanted to go back to acting. So I did it in New York uh, for about three or four years. And then I moved to L.A. And when I went to L.A., I went back to acting. I just wanted to act. And that's where my acting career kind of took off. And then I didn't do stand-up for 20 years. 
I think we're back into the game. Huh? What brought you back into the game? Well, it was kind of life. Um, my marriage, my first marriage ended, and she and my son moved uh, um, up to uh, um, up in California, up a place called Grass Valley, which um, is up near Sacramento. Um, anyway, I was doing the thing where I was a weekend dad, and you know, I didn't have my son until I was forty-five, so I had already done the ups and downs of the business. I just wanted to be where my son was. So I just moved to where my son was. And when I did that, my friends were like, well, hey, you're gonna make a living. I'm like, I'll figure something out. And that's when I, I sat myself down and said, well, what about stand-up? Would you be interested in you know, reconnecting to stand-up and see if that's something you could do? And then when I reconnected with stand-up, it was so great because for this main reason, I had so much more to talk about. You know, when, my, when I was 22, my whole act was, why won't she touch me? You know, that, that, that was my whole life experience. And, you know, as, and now as I'm older, they still won't touch me. But at least now I have more to talk about. Now I have a life, you know, this is so much more to draw from for stand-up. Uh, so when I went back to it, it felt better than it had felt the first time around. Because I felt like I had more inventory to pull from. I had more stuff to talk about. So uh, stand-up worked out. And then in another way, acting and stand-up are so different in so many ways. But let's just say acting is the most collaborative art form there is. You're working with the other actors. You're working with the director. You're working with lighting, makeup, hair, wardrobe, sets. It's collaborating with everybody, right? Stand-up is the least collaborative art form. You are just working with you. You're the writer, producer, director, talent, just you. And at this point in my life, I'm enjoying the non-collaborative art form. I like I like that analogy. I like how it's you're right. You're absolutely right. You're the one doing all the things behind you, you know. You're not yeah. you don't have some team telling you, hey, use this line or hey, you should definitely, you know, next right. time you gotta do this. You're even booking, you know. You may have yeah. an agent who's helping you book gigs and stuff like that, but you're still, you know, okay, here's my schedule for the week. I got to be here. Okay. I guess I'm going to Detroit tomorrow or, okay. Yeah, and you know, in acting, you get, in acting, you can get into it with people you don't even, you don't even imagine or your audience wouldn't imagine you get into it. Often I would disagree with wardrobe and I'll ch tell you how, because invariably I'd be playing a comedic character. And then often wardrobe would be, whoa, well, let's put them in funny clothes. It's like, no, 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 no. We want him to be wearing regular clothes and have the character be funny. Not when he walks in the door, you know, he's got a big red nose and, and big shoes and big clown shoes, right? So it's mm -hmm. like why we, I, for me, I was like, I don't want to telegraph that this is the funny character. And for the wardrobe people, they're like, well, they want an opportunity to do wardrobe for a funny character. So no matter what it is, it's always some sort of, um, you know, collaboration or agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now with stand up, I wear whatever the, whatever the hell I want to wear. There you, you know? go. Yeah. And, I, you know, I got I didn't really get into it. I mean, not huge arguments, but, you know, I had that discussion with uh, the Seinfeld people on Banya. You know, they wanted Banya in more uh, out there clothing. And I didn't win. I mean, I still think. Some of Banya's sweaters were insane, um, but you know I had to I had to give in in certain points. But there were some things I would just look at and go, "No, don't, don't. I don't want to wear that. Don't make me do that. Don't make you know. Let's not do that to the character." Mm -hmm. So, and then some things you have to do <laughs> that the audience never knows. Like this is a great little trivia thing. In the second episode, I do I did as Banya. I buy Kramer's suit off his back at like. Uh, I don't know what the store is supposed to be. It's supposed to be Bloomingdale's or something, right? So I, ha I have to buy his suit right off his back in the dressing room. Well, he's 6'5", and I'm 5'11". So it has to look like I could buy, you know, wear his suit out. So for that one episode, I wore four-inch lifts in my shoes for the entire episode just so that in the, sh in the two shot, it was close enough that you'd go, oh, yeah, he could buy his suit. Otherwise, it would look ridiculous. Like, well, if you bought a suit, you'd still have to take it to a tailor. <laughs> this would be you. 
<laughs> yes, that would be me exactly. <laughs> oh, what was it like working with those lifts? Like, what was it like? Did you like get used to them, or like how long they did used, it take? What do you mean the four of them, the cast? No, the the lifts. Oh, the like lifts. you said, you had to wear the oh, lifts. Yeah. Those guys. Um, it was brutal. It was brutal because you that is not where you want your energies. <laughs> That's not <laughs> where you want your mindset. So I would try and get planted. And I had scenes where I had to walk into the um, dressing room where the Kramer was with Jerry and I had to go in there and, and uh, I kept trying to argue and they could see what I was doing. They're like, you're going to have to walk in, <laughs> walk into the other room on camera. I'm like, okay. But if I could, I was trying to justify it where I, where I was planted because um Four inch lifts are big lifts. That's that's high. Uh, and then you you know, you know women do it uh, every dinner party they go to. But uh, for for me it was uh, it was pretty wild. So I would not say that was comfortable. Um, I don't think anybody could tell I was wearing four inch lifts. But um, yeah, it wasn't like oh you forget all about it. <laughs> I, I didn't forget about it at all. I was about to say to this day you go into a department store and look at them and go nope. No, nope. nope. <laughs> not happening. Not happening. Oh, you can only imagine me as a little person in those yeah. two, you know? Yeah. Well, I was thinking about that as I was just telling it. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that's something you do or have tried earlier in life or. I've actually, when I've done stand up comedy, when I've done like open mics, I've purposely told them, hey, leave the mic stand up. Like, leave yeah, it. Yeah, I'll bet. So that way, when, you, when I walk on stage, I go look like I'm. You know, just doing the last quick glance at my notes or something, you know, just doing the last flip of the note cards, yeah. not noticing it. And then I'll put the note cards down and I'll get ready. And then I'll just look up at the mic stand and be like. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and that's, that's, the, the, that's the opener. And that's you know? the idea is to be one. Obviously, it's a, it's set up that way, but it it gets you not rushing right away because those jokes that aren't verbal like that joke. You can't rush them. For the, you have to, you know, you have to take the time to look up, look mm -hmm. back, show the frustration. That almost puts you in a nice pace because so many young stand-ups or newer stand ups when I say young, I don't mean chronologically young. I just mean how much experience they have. Mm -hmm. And, um, the, you know, they just come out and they, they speedball the whole thing, you know. It's the, and that thing where you're doing something visual, that's a good way to get your pace to take it easy. I like that. I like because I'll admit I have been the new guy going like I got five minutes I got ten jokes here da, 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 da. thank you good yeah. night you only did yeah. three minutes you want to keep right. going or right something like well, that. all right I'll tell you a story when I passed at the comic strip in New York there was a legendary guy who decided if you pass there his name was Lucian Lucian Hold a very uh, kind of erudite sarcastic uh, distant intelligent sort of fellow. And when he passed me, he said something that on that day I thought was an insult. And it took me years to realize he was complimenting me in his own way. He said, uh, well, Mr. Heidner, I don't know about your material, but you stand there as good as anybody we have. And I was like, oh, you didn't like my material and, and stand it. And I just didn't, I couldn't comprehend that it was a compliment. And as I've now been doing it for so long and I see, you know, newer comedians, younger comedians, I always try and tell them if they ask, I don't, you know, jump down anybody's throat. I always just say, look, everyone's obsessed, especially newer comedians are obsessed with material. And yes, you have to have material, but what you really need to figure out, you, what you really, really need is the stage time. Like find out who are you up there? Who the hell are you up there? Well, I'm just myself. Well, you're not exactly, exactly yourself. So figure out who that is, right? So I, and it's hard because when I was doing it there, you could play all those clubs in one night. I would do four or five sets at different places, five, six nights a week. So I'm doing, you know, 25, 30 sets in a week. And it's what made what made that great was the stage time, not the running home and, and writing, 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 writing. 
Yes, you have to write. Yes, you have to have material. But if, if you just take the time and think of all the headliners that tour this country, they don't all have the greatest material in the world. You know, like the greatest material are people like Stephen Wright, right, where they can just recite their material and it's so strong that it doesn't, they don't have to perform it. But most of the time, most headliners are just in interesting people on stage and how they're performing it is interesting. And that's such a huge part of stand up. But when people are new, they just obsess on material, material, material. And what you were saying, you know, taking that five minutes and just rattle, rattling off as much material as you possibly can and not taking the time to just take a breath up there. Maybe a let, let a pause happen. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, a pause. And let's see who the, you know, see what that is. Mm -hmm. so and that's you're, what absolutely, you're right, because I remember my first full room laugh. Like, I remember the big, you know, the first big laugh. Yeah. And it caught me off guard because I I watch a video now and I'm like, I should have stopped there. Like, I should have stopped and inhaled that moment because it caught me off guard. Like, it was the first big, haha, because the joke goes, you know, I'm the hide and go seek champion of Erie, Pennsylvania because I'm a little person. Yeah. So they even awarded me one time with the Amber Alert. You know? <laughs> things like that and like yeah, i got that big laugh and i just i froze for a second and i started to go off but now i watched the video and i'm like you idiot you should have stopped there like just stop <laughs> let it go like let it go there for a minute yeah just let it let it sit let it sit mm -hmm. let it happen because you're also finding out about yourself during that quieter time right mm -hmm. and eventually you're gonna have to get to that place where well who am i up here so that's what I just try and tell younger comedians. It's like, yeah, stay obsessed with your material. I get it. But just try and at some point take a look at who the hell you are up there. Because, you know, there are, there are comedians, most headliners, they can create a vibe where even within an hour, the audience halfway through the show already knows their point of view, right? Mm -hmm. So they can be with the comedian on what his what his joke or point of view is going to be on that because they've gotten to know him right and that happens from you know stage presence and and uh, being available to be seen for who you are up there and i think more than not that's what turns people into headliners or not love it so what about what's your advice when it comes to um hecklers when it comes to dealing with them every comedian's gone through them at one point or another yeah i feel like um, there's a dip, there's different types. There's only, you know, the only one type of heckler, but there's different types of annoyances. So <clears throat> for me, hecklers and audience members are fascinated by hecklers. They're just always like, or even if you just tell people you're a comedian, like, what do you do with hecklers? Like they, they're so terrified of that concept. What's it like when you get a heckler? And for me, it's like, I, it's not that bad. It's like, look, just rattle it down. They're drunk, I'm not. I have the microphone, they don't. The crowd's on my side, not them, right? So I just try and add up the scorecard and go, all right, <clears throat> let's chat. And then what I try and do is make or allow, I don't have to make them, allow them to talk. And they'll usually just bury themselves, Right, because they're drunk and they're morons, and the crowd's on your side, and let them talk and make faces of what they're saying, or egg them on, and then the audience is laughing at that. It's not like you have to do this huge. I gotta shut this guy down. You know, you can just have the audience laughing at him long enough where he's just like, "All right, I'm an idiot." Right. Mm -hmm. So it's not about throwing um, kerosene on the fire. It's it's more about you know. I like my chances here. This, per this person, I, I really don't see them tearing, tearing me up here. Um, and if, you know, if I have to talk more to them, then I will. And if I have to go at it with them, then I will. I'll tell you that years ago, I was playing a club, um, the original Crackers in Indianapolis. Unbelievably well-run club. To the point of almost too well-run. Because the first time I played there and they're walking me around and they go, oh, and by the way, if you're getting heckled or having trouble with a table, we have a phrase. You just go, hey, how about a round of club sodas for this table? And then we'll take care. Of it. Well, any comedian or headliner worth his salt, I'd rather kill myself 
then go, <laughs> how about a round of club sodas for this table? Right? I would never, I would never surrender like that. You know, I'm always going to, you know, engage or try and put the fire out myself. And if they're so out of control, then the club's going to go deal with that anyway. Right? So I just try and take the stigma out of the fear of the heckler. Uh, you know what's really annoying? That was that reason I mentioned the other side. What's really annoying is, say, a bachelorette party that all have, like, you know, balloon penises on their head and whatnot, and they're kind of loud and they're not listening. So then that's annoying because you're like, well, do I go in and deal with them and try to, or do I leave them alone, but they're kind of loud? So you really, that gets into what I call the no win. <laughs> and the no win kind of is a crappy place to be. Mm -hmm. But if they're just so loud, then you just have to go in. Mm -hmm. But they're not even heckling you. They're not even, uh, you know, they're usually lost in their own little uh, celebration. So to mm -hmm. me, those are the hardest ones because you just have to uh, get in there and somehow get them to, you know, shut up. Mm -hmm. I've got a heckler story for you. I was Great. doing an open mic or I was doing a show and um, they're, you know, I'm doing my bit and I was, saying, you know, making my jokes and this guy was tagging along with them, like making all these comments after, you know, shouting all these comments after him. I finally just stood there, looked at him and said, sir, people ask me all the time, how small am I? I want to ask you right here, right now, how high are you right now? <laughs> That's he, started to answer, he started to answer and I'm like, no, no, no. I'm not asking about your physical stature. And then he was the next comedian up <laughs> after me. He was the next guy up after me. And he was the next comedian? Yeah. And he bombed. <laughs> He just, someone in the crowd shouted, little guy was funnier. <laughs> that I just did the little, I just did the little. Yes. Yes. Yep. <laughs> so speaking of comedy clubs, you're due here in Erie, Pennsylvania for an appearance coming up soon. I'm coming to, yeah, May 8th, May, uh, I fly the 18th, uh, Friday, Saturday, the 19th and 20th of May. Nice. And, you know, I've been there before. Uh, as you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it's such a great room. Now, it's it, is it new uh, new management since last I've been there? Yes. Yep. It's now called Keller's. It's a magic and comedy club. Great. Great. So do they do magic every, uh, like, will there be magic at my show or how do they do that? That I'm not sure. And I can't uh, give you an official answer or anything right, like right. that. You know, they do have like a magic bar, I know. So like when you, oh, cool. you know, like that hallway, you walk down to get yeah. into the room. Uh -huh. You know, like there's the bar and then where, you like, sell, where I sell my merchandise. Yeah. There's like a little table over like next to the bar. And I know they do like magic show. Like they'll do like magic there. Right. And there's all these like magic artifacts, like magic posters, things uh -huh. like that. So, yeah, but it's really, I, I love the room. It was a w really well set up comedy room last time. I yes. Was there. And it's still the same set, like it's still the the same table setup and everything right. like that. Like right. they haven't changed anything like that. They've just changed like the scenery, let's say. Yeah. You know. Well, you know, so, um, for me, uh, I do, uh, I do a lot of corporate because I'm I'm recognizable enough from my TV stuff, and I can work clean, so I can get corporate and corporate. You know, obviously pays more which is awesome. But, you know, they're never, you know, a lot of times they're in large banquet rooms and, you know, just not great comedy setups. Or, you know, I'll do smaller theaters and those are great, but, you know, the theaters by nature have incredibly high ceilings, right? And then you, you know, you go back and you do a classic comedy room and it's tight and the ceiling's low and the laughs are banging off the walls. And you're like, ah, oh, this is the best environment. It's just the best environment to do it. And uh, it's just so enjoyable. And when I haven't done a classic club in a while, I get excited because I love that vibe. I love that that feeling. You're not going to get that from corporate. Uh, although the shows go well. I'm not saying they don't go well. But first of all, there's usually like 10 or 12 round banquet tables with 10 people at each one, right? If not more tables. So then when you're on stage, half the crowd's facing the other direction <laughs> with the round tables. So you got to get the, you know, that to change. And then usually there's like a dance floor between the stage and then the tables. So there's like this huge moat 
that's between you. So you just kind of go, okay, this is what corporate is and you do it and it's fine. And some of them go well, but it never has that, never has that bang feeling of a comedy club. Mm -hmm. So you'd say your experience was quite a positive one when you came to Erie last time. There, I, I think I've been there twice. Um, mm -hmm. And it was extremely positive, extremely positive. Awesome. I, I'm, you know, the, uh, the ownership at the time was very good to me. Uh, the crowds were uh, exceptionally strong, full rooms. And on, this, on the last note, they bought a lot of merch. There you go. <laughs> there you go. I was looking for, I think it's in, I think um, it's probably in the laundry or something, but I was looking for my t-shirt today for this interview. I was oh, looking for that's my... the, uh, that's the, that's gold, Jerry gold t-shirt. Yep. Yeah. So now I have a new one. I, I went with the uh, soup is not a meal. <laughs> t-shirt. I know what I'm getting next time I go. <laughs> so, yeah, but I, in all seriousness, my, my memory of, uh, of that club was, is very, um, very positive. Awesome. And also, if it wasn't positive, if it was negative, I wouldn't go back. You know, yeah. I, had you a, go. I had an experience once. Uh, I won't name the club, but uh, it was a place in Ohio. And uh, the deal was if I sold out, I had a bonus. And uh, the room was absolutely packed. And um, the uh, feature act is up. I'm not up yet, but the show's going, right? Show's going. The feature act is up and the place is packed. And the owner comes down with two folding chairs and opens them up. I'm like, are the people coming down? He goes, no, no, no. It's just more chairs. And I go, I could just see. I go, are you going to claim this is not a sellout because of those two chairs you just brought down? He goes, well, it's not. I mean, you know, these chairs are available. And I said to him, look, let's just cut to the chase. If you don't pay me my bonus for a sellout, you will never see me in this room ever again. And he goes, it's not a solo. What do you want me to do? So, um, you know, needless to say, you know, he didn't pay me the bonus. And but of course, a year later, he contacts my booker. He's like, we'd love to have Steve back. And he's like, didn't Steve tell you <laughs> if you didn't play, pay the bonus? <laughs> yep. You know, that's the moment, number one, when your agent is on the other line, pressing the mute button and just laughing his head off. Okay? <laughs> and, going, and then going, oh, yeah. So about that, did Steve tell you, you know, but that is like that to me is like the the Banya moment of, um, <laughs> you know, because it's like it's super meal or not. Like, well, technically, you didn't sell out because here are two seats, you know, two seats. <laughs> Just like, you see, well, it's soup. Soup's not a meal, so you didn't buy me a meal. That's so insane. So, you know, usually when when something on a contract for this kind of thing for your audience, if it's this, if it's a based on a sellout, usually if you sell 95%, the club or whatever just gives you the bonus because you don't want to get into a couple of seats, right? So if you book at 95, 97%, usually the club's like, great, you know? I got a full house. You get your bonus. This guy brings down two folding chairs to try and screw me. Sheesh, Louise. <laughs> Showbiz. <laughs> now, going back to Banya, I got to ask, what does is, what is Kenny think of BuddyCast? <laughs> well, first of all, Kenny would adore BuddyCast because he would have a bright white light in his face and someone would be listening to him. So first of all, he would adore every aspect of being able to share his opinions about everything and anything. So uh, I think uh, I think he'd be a, a big fan. And if I can get a little schmaltzy, uh, he would absolutely love it because you're a bright, intelligent, easy person to talk to and uh, answer questions from. Thank you. That gives me a backup. That gives me a content idea. We should have an episode of Kenny Pena on BuddyCast. You know, that's interesting because, you know, and I would uh, I would attempt it because I was thinking about doing it act wise. Mm -hmm. um, but my problem with it is you can't really bomb for 45 minutes to an hour, you mm -hmm. know? So it's like, it's hard to do. And then I was like, well, maybe I could just do a chunk as Banya, but then that just didn't seem quite worth it. But I have I just, thought about it of like, sometimes going on the road as Banya, sometimes going on the road as me, but I, I'm I'm challenged, not that it can't be done, but I'm challenged by doing 45 that, mm -hmm. you know, doesn't get laughs, but gets laughs because it's not funny. 
Mm-hmm. And just to let you know, on BuddyCast, we go from anything from I've done episodes in 15 minutes and I've done episodes that have gone over an hour. You know, right. I will tell you, I've had I've had some of your co-stars on BuddyCast, including the Soup Nazi. Oh, Larry. Yes. I've had Larry and I've had um, Danny, Danny Woodburn. Oh, yeah, yeah. I love those guys. And Larry's first answer took 20 minutes and he answered <laughs> four questions in one. Yeah, you know what? If you think I'm surprised by that, I'm not. <laughs> he answered four questions in one. And I'm like, this is going to be an episode. Like every time I tried to speak, he just went on to a new topic. You know, it's funny because I a couple of my answers I thought were a little too long here. No, 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 no. <laughs> I we hung up that episode, and you know, I'm gonna ask you, you know, stick around for a minute. We'll chat afterwards. Yeah. He hung up immediately, and I was just sitting there like, oh, age. He's like, <laughs> oh. uh, so. you know, I saw him not that long ago. I don't do a ton of those. Um signing shows mm-hmm. I just, like comic cons and stuff yeah it's uncomfortable for me to just sit there and have the line and sign and photo I, I i just don't enjoy it that much i've done a couple of things where somebody will fly me in and have me sign a bunch of stuff just at, at their place or at my hotel and then i fly out the next day but the actual going to the events and sitting there i, I just feel i don't like it that much i, I much prefer to do stand up or do something like that you know and do like a VIP at the at the clubs or something, but I don't really dig. But this was one that Larry was on. Is Larry does them all the time, and uh, not nothing wrong with that. I just I, I just don't love the sitting there. And we uh, sat next to each other for the whole day, and we got a chance to catch up and stuff. But nice. Well, when you say he went off on a twenty minute dance, <laughs> that was joke. Like go get, you can watch the episode on our Facebook page. <laughs> Every time I try to say something, he goes on to another topic. I'm like, <laughs> I was like, eh, 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 oh, you know, like I'm trying to ask, like, hey, follow up question. Nope. Yeah, I'm you gonna... know, that was a fascinating episode. You know, I never really talked to Larry about it in that the network was worried about it just because of the Nazi reference. Hmm. And um, the episode got laughs, but it didn't get maybe some of the laughs that upper episodes from, I'm talking about the studio audience, just the Mm -hmm. studio audience. But I don't know if it popped the way some other episodes have popped. So I think the network was a little nervous, but when the episode aired, it popped huge. It was huge. But I do remember when they were doing it, I know NBC was all kind of a little weirded out about the the, the not soup Nazi aspect. But I mean, Larry just turned that, he killed that role and he turned it into a like a cottage industry for himself. And 100%. I, I couldn't be happier for him. He should, he, he does it really well. Mm-hmm. I, always, I will also say I loved your line when you were looking up the Seinfeld character, the top co-stars online. Yeah. I love the part when you're like, you found like an article. This was when the last time you were in Erie, you found an article like top 100, like Seinfeld co stars or something like that. And you're like, okay, we're in the 50s. We're in the 40s. We're in the 30s. And then you get to, I think you were like, what'd you say, number 15 or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I forgot I used to do that. You're yeah. reminding me of it right yeah. now. You're like, you were number 15. You know who's number 14? The soup Nazi. He was in one episode. Was in one episode. And I was in that episode. <laughs> That's my entire bit. I, I haven't done that bit in years. I was dying at that bit because you're absolutely. It's like one of those. It's like one of those slaps to the faces. Here's yeah. one guy. You know, here's you who's been in multiple episodes. Here's the guy that was in the same episode as you, only episode on his resume, and there he is. That is you know? so funny. I forgot about that. I did used to do that in my act. I mean, I haven't done mm-hmm. that. Either. I haven't done that in some time, mm-hmm. but uh, he was, uh, he's great in that role. He's great in that role. Mm-hmm. And, uh, still- you know, working, working with Jerry is interesting because um, the idea, people think that you can't change a com- you can't change a word. You can't change a comma. You can't change anything. But um, Seinfeld was a classic four camera sitcom, which means you rehearse all week and do it in front of a studio audience at the end of the week. So you were free to do anything you wanted during the week, to try anything you wanted. It was just on tape night, everything needed to be set. So Jerry was, he had such a 
precise funny button. Like I don't know what I was doing uh, or what episode it was, but I did something and like the whole the set, the crew, everybody fell apart when I did it. And then we tried that scene again. And at that moment, I tried something else. And Jerry just stopped. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm trying something else. He goes, no, no, no. He goes, you have that. We're done with that moment. Put that back. <laughs> so, when, so his button is like, you can try anything you want. But once we have it, you lock that in. <laughs> Once it's done, it's done. There's no. Yeah, we're hey, done I, there. We, I want to put my spin on it. I want to do something. Sorry, already yeah, done. Yeah. So that's how he is. Like, cause he has an amazing fun. He has an amazing uh, funny button of. Oh no, that's it right there. That's it. Mm -hmm. And once you have it, you know, the, we're done. We're done working there. We're done experimenting. It's not one of those people where, hey, I like that. Let's try that again and keep doing, like, keep doing it until it's going to be perfect. It's just. One and done. That was perfect. Let's keep it real. Yeah. You know, he scene. just wants to find the funny. And once it's found, we got it. it. Moving on. Moving exactly. on. Don't forget it. Remember how to do it. Yep. Then so, buddy, I got, yep, I got two more questions for you to make this an official buddy cast. Sure. The first one is brought to us by my buddy, Jones Kane at Hashtag Positivity. He wants to know, in your own words, what does it mean to be someone's buddy? Oh, wow. It's a heavy question. I, I accept the question, but that's a, that's a heavy question. Um, <clears throat> I have gotten compliments um, in my life from being a funny person. I just, uh, when you say, what, what does it mean? I'll tell you what it means to me. Um, there's the one where at a club where the people come over to you after the show and they share with you uh, that they are going, just getting through some horrible times. And they didn't think they could laugh again. And that the idea that they spontaneously were laughing, they weren't even noticing they were laughing uh, till the show was over. And they found it important to wait on the line to say hi to me, take a picture, to share with me how much it meant that I could be a conduit to uh, some happiness. And, you know, we don't forget, but we can take a moment to laugh. And so to me, that is one of, that's probably the greatest uh, part of being funny. And then the other one is, um, I'm not a huge fan of guys who, uh, funny people who can't, uh, who are on all the time. Like I like people, like funny people can turn it off a little bit too. So sometimes socially I'll turn on, but sometimes I'm not. Mm -hmm. And I got a compliment in a social setting that said, you know what's fun about hanging out with you, Steve? Not only are you funny, but you make everybody around you feel like they can be funny. And to me, that was a great compliment as well, because it's not something to be hoarded or to show the room that only you can do it. It's like, what if what if you're actually making everybody feel a little funnier or making everybody feel like they're not they're a little vulnerable enough to actually say something that might be funny. Right. So I would say those uh, those two things would be the answer to that. Wonderful. The final question we have for you tonight is what's called the ultimate buddy cast buddy question. You ready for this one? I hope so. <laughs> I'm going to split it in two parts for you. All right. First one is for anyone out there who dreams of doing stand up comedy, what is your advice to them? Well, <clears throat> my advice to them in the broad sense uh, is not only do it, but do it sooner than you're thinking you're going to do it. That uh, because that gets into the more broader life advice of look, life is short. Okay, I'll I'll get uh, I'll get heavy with you for the last little part. Are you allowed to get heavy on BuddyCast? Absolutely. Okay, I was talking to you about my son. I lost my son last year. I'm sorry my son, to hear that. Uh, my son passed at 16 from a rare bone cancer. So take a lesson from Jack. And if you have anything you're thinking of doing. I strongly recommend you do it. Uh, then as it particularly uh, pertains to stand-up, um, it, it is an unbelievable, vulnerable moment. And you know, you did it, you do it. Um, but that first time of walking up, when I did stand-up, the first six months I did it, when I passed at the comic strip, I was wearing a guitar when I did stand-up. I don't play the guitar. So... 
I don't know. I think because, you know, the little belly of the guitar, maybe I had my act in there or I just wanted something between me and the audience. For six months, I had a guitar on. And then like if I did a joke that didn't work, which we all do when we're new, right? I would just go boing. And, you know, I started incorporating it. But I wore a guitar to somehow protect myself. Then six months in, I was like, I don't think I need the guitar. But the point is, that's how that's how scared I was. I brought a weapon. You know, so um, that I'm saying that in the way of do it, do that, become that person that can put yourself in that in, in that crosshair. And that crosshair is some really bright lights. I remember the first stand up I ever did. I, you know, I happened to look at the bright light and bang that first three minutes. I could hear myself, but I was blind because I happened to have looked right into the light. So I had that white light buzzing around my eyes for three minutes. But I would say um, do it because of the incredible feeling of trying to uh, tackle fears and being on the other side of that and do it because uh, life is short. Mm -hmm. I would say if I could teach a public speaking class, the first assignment I would do is say, you're going to go on stage in front of all your peers and do five minutes of comedy. Because if you can laugh at yourself and have people laugh at you and be okay with yourself, you can do right. anything. And they never, they, they'll never realize how long five minutes is. <laughs> Until they <cut. laughs> that's a that's a really different five minutes when you get up to do your first five minutes and mm -hmm. the, whatever is going well or poorly, you're at a minute and a half and you think you're at five. Yep. <laughs> and there. Final uh, question I have for you tonight. Same question. Advice for anyone out there who wants to go into acting. Uh, you know, for me, uh, there's two different ways you can do it. You can get involved in your community and you can um, do Macbeth in your uh, local summer stock or whatnot. For me, I wanted to swim in the big pool. I wanted to throw myself into the pool and see if I was somebody who could swim. Right. So I moved into Manhattan, studied with the teachers, got an acting job, got involved in improv groups because you want to be involved in groups where somebody breaks out. Right. And then maybe they can take you with them where, oh, well, I need a writer or, you know, that the friends of people, your colleagues, some of them are going to are going to pop. Right. So that's puts putting yourself in that bigger pool. But some people can just enjoy doing, you know, regional theater and doing roles they'd never get a chance to play in big, big professional areas. So that's two different ways to look at it. So I would. I personally chose to jump into the big pool and just see what the deal was. Um, but I can certainly, I certainly have friends that stayed, on, I grew up on Long Island, that stayed on Long Island and do, you know, do plays on Long Island and they, they love it, you mm -hmm. know, but uh, stand up, uh, rather acting was my first love. It'll always be, uh, it'll always be my first love as a performer. I take tremendous pride in having monetized two art forms, acting and stand up. Um, I do take great pride in that. And um, <clears throat> I feel like if you, similar to the standup, if you want to do it, you know, dive into that. But <clears throat> it is a harder dive in that you have to put yourself in positions. Stand up and just go do an open mic somewhere. Acting, mm -hmm. you, have to, you know, you have to be with other people and figure it out. It's collaborative, right? Mm -hmm. so that is more challenging. But those are the two, those are the two areas that I, I see out there. There's one you want to try and do it as a hobby, just see how you enjoy it, how you feel about it, and just get involved with the local theater. Or be insane like me and <laughs> and dive into Lake Erie. There you go. Hey, it, gets, it warms up around this point, you know? <laughs> well, in late May, we're, we're all going to be walking around in T-shirts. Exactly. Hey, if you see all four seasons when you come here, it's it's normal, you know? <laughs> so, but see... Thank you so much for this episode. Thank you for being a buddy on BuddyCast. You're not a guest. You're a buddy. Thank you, buddy. Thank yep. you, buddy. I enjoyed it very much. Enjoyed the chat. And thanks for having me on. Of course. You know you're welcome back anytime. Like I said, we're going to have to get Kenny Vania on this episode. I'm going to think episode. about it. I'm going to think yeah. about it. Because hey. I would like to try and work on little chunks where, because I think Banya can be hilarious. Exactly. And, you know, for number one, stick around for a minute. We'll chat afterwards. Sure. But number two, um, I have one favor to ask you before we close out this episode. Whatever you do today, 
tomorrow, next week, next month, or even next year, please promise me you're going to go out and be someone's buddy. <laughs> I, You know what? I can promise that. I promise you I'll be somebody's buddy. Awesome. For all my buddies out there, this is my buddy, Steve Heitner. Please, if you're in the Erie area, catch his show. You won't regret it. You know, watch an episode of Seinfeld. We all love Seinfeld. <laughs> I'm your host, Nick Sorensen. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Everybody's Favorite Show. Well, the days are going fast. Buddy, buddy, we've got to make them last. Buddy, buddy, before they've all gone past. Buddy, buddy, tune in to Buddy Cast. Don't be lonely, make it, buddy. Here on 